Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rutter, Director of Public Relations at American Bird Conservancy. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel afterwards. We'll be putting the links referenced in the chat, but in case you missed them or can't copy them down fast enough, please know that everything can be found in a follow-up email we'll send to registrants and on our website. Again, this is being recorded and will be shared afterwards. Please submit any questions you have during the presentation using the chat box, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can during the question and answer portion at the end of the presentations. But before I begin, I wanted to share some background on American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC. Next slide, please. It was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. And we continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid featured on the current slide. Our work strives to help keep common birds common and prevent the rarest species from going extinct. Climate change falls into the yellow colored base level of this pyramid, given that it's a threat to all birds. As we're working to increase renewable energy to combat climate change, it's critical that projects protect birds and other wildlife, as well as help our society. ABC's BirdSmart Wind Energy Program works with policymakers, private sector, and other partners to reduce the threat of wind energy to birds by pushing for better siting and alternative options like distributed solar, which also has important benefits for people and communities. Today, you'll hear from our panelists about this topic and ways to take action. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. David Wienfeld is ABC's senior conservation scientist. David received his PhD from Florida State University. His work focuses on bird population ecology and conservation biology. Previously, David served for five years as director of research at the Sutton Avian Research Center, working primarily on prairie chickens, and was also head of the Department of Vertebrate Oncology at the Charles Darwin Research Station in the Galapagos Islands. His work has primarily been with bird populations, but also included projects on invasive species, including predators, diseases, and parasites. Joel Merriman is BirdSmart Wind Energy Campaign Director at ABC. Joel grew up fascinated by the great outdoors and got hooked on birds while earning a Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife Science, wildlife science at Purdue University. This led him to complete a Master's of Science in Wildlife Management at Texas Tech University, where his thesis focused on bird aircraft strike hazards. He has been a birder for more than 20 years and enjoys introducing people to our feathered friends. Justenia Rivera is Solar United Neighbors Director of Energy Equity and Inclusion. Justenia has been focusing on community development for over 10 years, and she has a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from the University of Puerto Rico, Calle, and a JD from the University of the District of Columbia, David A. Clark School of Law. As the DC Program Di Director, Justenia implemented Sun's Solar for All program and now works to increase access to solar energy across the country. So with that, David is going to start our presentations by sharing more about the impact of climate change specifically on birds. Hi, good, good morning or afternoon. I uh, hope uh, I got muted and everyone can, can hear me. Um, so human-induced climate change uh, from greenhouse gas emission is a very important issue with the potential to affect not only uh, birds, but all other life on, on planet Earth. As you know, its effects will include not only rising temperatures, but shifts in the locations and patterns of things like rainfall and snowfall. Uh, rising sea levels, um, and increasing extreme weather events. Uh, one example of extreme weather events we might see are things that we've seen in, here in the, the Western US just in the last few weeks. So, High temperatures do other things uh, as well, such as making wildfires more likely. And we've seen that also in the, this with uh, significant wildfires occurring in California and Oregon and Idaho and other places in the West. And in the Southwestern US, we already know that uh, climate change is increasing uh, 
wildfires. There we go. Um, increasing temperatures and shifting rainfall also affect bird habitats, the places where birds live. And here in the Northern Hemisphere, these habitats tend to move northward as warm adapted plants and trees move into areas where they weren't able to live before as those new areas become warmer. However, new habitats take time to establish and all plants in a landscape don't adapt at the same rate. Soils take time to, to develop and trees take time to grow. So building a new functioning ecosystem in a new area takes time. So shifting a habitat northward and making it a place where birds can thrive is not uh, simple. In addition, some habitats have nowhere to shift to. On mountains, habitats can shift up, but those at the top have nowhere to go. We're already seeing this uh, with the now endangered rosy finches, which are high mountain species in the Western US that are losing their breeding habitats. The same is true of habitats bounded to the north by lakes or the ocean. Uh, there's simply nowhere for the new habitat to move to. We're already seeing this in the high Arctic where the treeless tundra, which is used by many shorebirds and ducks and geese for breeding is being invaded by shrubs and, and trees, which provide habitat and cover for predators that hunt the, the uh, nests and nestlings and even the adults of these species have contributed to the decline of a number of these, but there's nowhere for these birds to go to the north. Everything there is, is water or ice. Sea level rise um, is also a significant uh, factor in as a result of, of the melting of ice in places such as Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, coastal areas around the world are already heavily affected by humans with construction of buildings and seawalls uh, in so many areas and, and draining of estuaries and marshes in many other places. Loss of these coastal zones already threatens many uh, shore and marsh birds, species like piping plover or black rail or, um, or salt marsh sparrow. And rising uh, sea levels tend to push these birds' habitats inland and they are caught between the rising ocean and the, the built structures, making what little habitat they, they had previously uh, go away. Increasing temperatures also have direct impacts on birds, not just through changes in their habitats. Like humans, birds can only tolerate temperatures at a certain level. And in areas like the southwestern US deserts or the interior of Australia, places that are already very hot, temperature is a bit higher than normal kill birds. In several Western Australian heat waves over the last few years with temperatures above 117 degrees, which is a level that no bird can tolerate for long, there have been die-offs of many thousands of uh, budgerickers and zebra finches. But even at less extreme levels, increasing temperatures reductions in reproductive rates of birds. A study in the central U.S. of Acadian flycatcher nest success uh, showed that when temperatures increased above the long-term averages, the nest success decreased. It's thought this is because the uh, adults are less able to forage for food to feed their nestlings because they spend more time resting in, 
in the shade to avoid high temperatures. And at the same time, uh, predators such as small mammals and, and snakes have increased metabolic needs and can have more opportunities to prey on nests and, and nestlings. So there will be serious threats to birds and most other living things from climate change. So how can we help to keep these things from happening? Uh, climate change scientists generally refer to three types of actions that can be taken to confront climate change. First is just accommodating climate change, which we call adaptation. Second is increasing one's ability to respond to climate change in place, and that's called resiliency. The third is to avoid the problem altogether by stopping the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions and hopefully stopping the climate change. And this is referred to as mitigation. Well, mitigation comes in many forms, such as reforestation, which would be planting of trees in areas that have been deforested to take carbon dioxide that's already been in the atmosphere out of the atmosphere. But we can also reduce the uh, amount of greenhouse gases that are, that are emitted in the atmosphere by reducing energy consumption or by um, using two alternative energy sources that don't emit uh, carbon dioxide, such as wind or solar power. Um, wind and solar power both offer great opportunities to mitigate climate change. Uh, that is to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases from energy production. In this webinar, we have a couple of other experts who are going to discuss these technologies. You've already met. Environmentally and socially responsible alternative energy is very much needed if we're going to avoid uh, climate change catastrophe for birds. So I'm going to turn it over now to Joel Merriman and he'll tell us uh, more about the WindSmart uh, Energy Program. Well, thank you very much. Um, I am Joel Merriman. I'm the BirdSmart Wind Energy Campaign Director here at American Bird Conservancy. Thank you all very much for joining. Um, so I am going to focus on the wind portion here. So David gave us a, a very good overview of the impacts that climate change is having and will have on our bird populations. And of course, this is going to require an aggressive and multifaceted approach to reverse climate change. And one of the, the most important things that that requires is going to be a rapid decarbonization of our energy sector. And that, if I can get the slides to advance here, is where renewable energy comes in. And there are many forms of renewable energy. Um, the wind and solar are the ones that are most rapidly growing and the ones that are most widely deployable. So that's what we're going to be focusing on in our webinar today. And I am going to be speaking specifically about the wind piece. So we've come a long way with wind energy development in the US. At this point, we have more than 69,000 wind turbines in 43 US states. And that is just in the terrestrial environment. We also have uh, just a very small start to the offshore wind energy industry as well. Um, the first facility was five turbines that went in off the coast of Block Island in Rhode Island. Those are in state waters. And at this point, we also have two turbines installed in federal waters offshore of Virginia Beach in the great state of Virginia. And we also know that this industry is going to be accelerating. 2020 was actually a record year for both wind and solar. And we know that we are just getting started. We have a very supportive uh, partner in the Biden administration right now. And certainly Congress is, is doing a lot right now to find ways to accelerate deployment of renewable energy to, to mitigate climate change. So um, we've got a lot more coming. And I mentioned, in passing a little bit, the, the offshore wind energy sector, that is uh, something that is moving very quickly. If you saw on the previous slide, the Biden administration has set a goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Um, 
the way that they are coming out with notices of intent and things like that for us to comment on publicly, um, I believe that they can do it if they continue at this pace. You can see here, the majority of the facilities that are being considered are in New England, um, but we do have facilities from New England down through South Carolina on the Atlantic coast. Um, there is movement now on facilities off the coast of California in the Pacific and a little farther down the road, um, we expect to see some facilities uh, considered ultimately in Hawaii as well. So um, certainly a very busy space. So why does wind energy need to be bird smart? The unfortunate fact is that wind energy development and operation of wind energy facilities does have negative effects on bird populations. Uh, our current estimate is that wind energy facilities and wind turbines kill more than half a million birds every year. Um, and that is just the direct impacts from collisions with the turbines themselves. There's additional mortality associated with this industry that comes from the necessary construction of power lines to connect new wind energy facilities to the energy grid. We know that power and transmission lines um, do kill birds both through electrocution and collisions. Um, that's been estimated at about 30 million additional birds a year that are killed um, by those industries. And so that does have a little bit of additional impact. Um, then we also have the issue of displacement. When wind energy facilities are built, sometimes that alters the habitat in that area in such a way that the habitat is no longer usable by species that might have been found there before. And that's particularly problematic for species that have the need for large blocks of habitat, which in many cases are species that are, are species of conservation concern. And for some species, the, the loss to wind turbines and, and wind energy facilities may be sustainable, but that's not necessarily true for all species. And that's particularly true for those species that have a slow rate of reproduction, um, things like um, golden eagles, other raptors, um, that can be more substantially affected by this industry in the long term. So um, in the offshore environment, quickly, um, this is a, a mature industry now in Europe. There have been offshore wind energy facilities in Europe for more than 20 years at this point. So they've been able to do some good science there, which is informing our process on, on this side of the Atlantic. Um, but the impacts are much the same. Um, collisions are a concern. Birds can collide with the, the wind turbines in the offshore space. And displacement is an issue. For, for some species, displacement has actually been found to be the bigger problem uh, between collisions and displacement. For example, there was a, a fairly recent study that found that red-throated loons displayed avoidance behavior up to about 10 miles from offshore wind facilities. And you can see in the figure here, this is a bit of an older study, but it, it shows how some birds will avoid wind turbine arrays in the offshore space. So that's where bird smart wind energy comes in. American Bird Conservancy is very much in support of decarbonization, movement to renewables, and wind energy in particular, um, but this has to be bird smart. And so for us, this entails adhering to seven principles. So these are our principles of bird smart wind energy. Obviously, I'm not going to go through all of these right now. Um, there's more information on our website if you want more, but I do want to highlight a couple of these. Number two is really um, in many ways the most important. Turbines, wind turbines have to be sited in appropriate areas that are low risk for birds. This is really where the rubber hits the road on, on minimizing the impacts of this industry because unfortunately we don't, we still don't have a lot of measures to minimize impacts to birds once the turbines are constructed. So we need to make sure that we're putting them in the right places. And of course, to flip that around, we need to make sure we don't put turbines in the wrong places. And number seven here, we're gonna to touch on just a little bit later, um, which is all renewable energy alternatives are considered in any given area. We need to make sure that we're putting, we're using the right medicine for, for the whatever area that we're looking at in particular, because there are, are, there are sources of renewables that are more and less appropriate in different circumstances. So how do we promote bird smart wind energy? We do this in a number of ways. One of these is that we provide information and resources to the wind energy industry, to policymakers, to folks who are making decisions about wind energy facilities, and to the conservation and advocacy community. So this is our wind risk assessment map. This is on our website. And this is a tool that we developed um, maybe six, seven years ago 
that shows areas that are, are better and worse for wind energy development. Obviously, the areas that are in red are areas that should be avoided for wind energy development. And there are, are different shades of orange here, as you can see, darker orange means that it, a, an area that needs to be given a little more consideration. You need to maybe think a little harder before you would consider a, a wind facility there. Um, the lighter shades of orange just provide different sources of information. Like for example, the stripe right down the middle is the migratory pathway of the whooping crane. Um, so all this just provides information to, again, developers, um, folks who are reviewing wind energy applications to, to make sure that folks know where there are, there are bird considerations that really must be taken seriously. We have uh, a, a fact sheet, a one-page fact sheet that we developed that just really provides an overview of what the concerns are about wind energy, provides our bird smart wind energy principles, points you to our wind risk assessment map. This is available on our website. So this is something that we provide to policymakers, other decision makers. And this is something that's available to all of you to do the same if you're ever working with your decision makers and want to provide information about uh, wind energy and how to minimize impacts to birds. We also put a lot of effort into communications and this has a number of audiences. Certainly this is for ABC members, um, but this is for anyone who's interested in this issue. And again, interested in trying to figure out how to minimize the impacts of this industry to birds. Um, so we try to keep everybody up to date on all of that. And one of the ways to make sure that you're up to date on that, we do actually have uh, a BirdSmart Wind Energy newsletter. This comes out three to four times a year um, and really kind of tries to cover what are the, the, the current events that really matter, what is the, the latest science that has come out, um, and just try to keep everybody up to date on things. So uh, another way that we make sure that wind energy is bird smart is we have to be vigilant to make sure that turbines are going into the right locations. And sometimes that is not the case. Uh, sometimes wind facilities are proposed in very bad locations for birds. And so in those instances, we have to make sure that everyone is well aware that these turbines are being placed in the wrong, in the wrong location. Um, and that can involve advocacy of a number of sorts, um, certainly working with the industry, working with decision makers, and ensuring that um, changes are made to these facilities to, to reduce or avoid their, their potential impacts on birds. Um, we also take an active role in policy. Um, a lot of our policy work is at the federal level with Congress and working with the Biden administration. Um, one piece that we're working on with Congress is the Migratory Bird Protection Act. This would actually strengthen the existing Migratory Bird Treaty Act, or when it is ultimately restored, um, will strengthen, would strengthen the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And the, the beauty of this is that it would require the, the wind, energy and other wind energy industry and other industries to adhere to best management practices, effectively creating this, this policy solution to make, to make wind energy bird smart. Um, and that would come with a, a, a permitting process that would really get, get that operationalized and, and ensure that everybody knows what everyone's supposed to do, providing certainty for both the conservation and community and the industry. We do get involved in policy at the state level. Um, this is some news that came from Virginia earlier this year. Virginia actually passed a, a, a migratory bird protection regulation that was the first of its kind in the country. And this essentially does exactly what the Migratory Bird Protection Act would do nationally. Um, it provides that permitting system and it provides that process based in best man use of best practices to ensure protections for migratory birds um, in the state. And so we, we certainly recommend anyone um, taking a look at that. We'd love to see that replicated in other states. Um, if anybody is interested or has any questions, feel free to contact me. I would love to chat about that. Um, and then on the right hand side of the screen here, sometimes state policy is not bird smart and we also have to raise the red flag about that. Um, this example comes from New York. It's a, a recent law that they passed to accelerate renewable energy development, which is, is a good goal and one that we certainly support, but they removed entirely too many protections for birds. Um, so we have asked them to go back and uh, create a better regulation and one that provides more protections. So going back to step number seven, uh, the seventh principle of bird smart wind energy, looking at all of your renewable energy solutions, I want to give a shout to distributed solar energy. And this is when you put 
solar panels on rooftops, over parking lots, in industrial sites, and basically anywhere that's already degraded, um, and certainly any, any available sites in the urban landscape. And we know that this can supply all of the energy needs in some places. For example, there was a recent study that came from the, the Nature Conservancy and Defenders of Wildlife that found that in Long Island in New York, all of Long Island's energy could be provided by low impact solar, which then does not have any impact on, on wildlife habitat. And that's a pretty energy hungry part of the world. So that's a, a pretty remarkable outcome. Part of the beauty of this is that there is no need for grid infrastructure. We don't need additional transmission or power lines for this because it's already in the built environment, which reduces additional bird mortality from collisions and, and electrocutions. And at the end of the day, this is all bird smart. We're, we're decarbonizing, we're moving closer to our renewable energy goals, but distributed solar has no impacts to birds that we are aware of. So um, it's all positive and we'll be hearing more about it in a little bit. Um, so we have, we are very excited. We have recently parter, partnered with a campaign uh, called 30 Million Solar Homes. And we're very lucky that we have Jacinia Rivera from Solar United Neighbors to talk a little bit more about that. So Jacinia, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Joel. Um, I'll go ahead and switch here. And then, sorry for that. Yes, uh, so Nisani Arrivera, I am the Director of Energy Equity and Inclusion for Solar United Neighbors, as uh, Joel mentioned. And wanted to uh, talk a little bit about us. We're a nonprofit based here in the district, uh, 501c3. And our mission is to educate folks about going solar and help them go solar as, a, as an individual, and also educate them about community solar and the options they have if they're interested in solar energy and fight for their energy rights. Uh, you heard from David and Joel on why there is a need for a transition to clean energy and how beneficial solar energy can be to this transition. My focus today is on creating a just transition, one where we all have access to solar energy. And if you remember this winter, uh, Texas, as well as this summer, the energy crisis that we saw in Texas, it's highlighting that we're in the middle of a global energy crisis. And communities all around the country and all around the world are facing climate change uh, challenges that simply need to be addressed. In the coming decades, billions of dollars are going to be spent in creating this new energy system. And it's not a matter of if this will happen, it's a matter of when this transition is already underway. And we're expecting that the bulk of new renewables, uh, sorry, new generation added to the grid is gonna come from renewable energy, wind, solar, hydro. So we have an opportunity here to create a new energy system that doesn't just solve for climate change, but also addresses the issues of equity and social justice, like access, affordability, housing stock, education, among others. And we need to take the moment to acknowledge that the systemic racism and injustice that is inherent in our current energy system and flip that into creating a new system that overcomes these hurdles. We can't just transition to renewables for the sake of transitioning. We have to be smart about it and we have to be deliberate and, and reinvent the system. So how do we create a just transition? We do that by powering 30 million solar homes with rooftop and community solar. They will give people the power to save money, create jobs, protect our climate while addressing energy injustice. This program will expand access to solar ownership and its benefits to low and moderate income families in the US, rural communities, communities of color, and marginalized communities that have been left out of the transition to solar energy. Uh, what does this look like? If we are able to ad adopt all of the policies that were suggested in the 30 million solar home program, we're looking at a significant increase in new solar capacity across every single state in the US. Over the next five years, 
with these policies, we're going to add 151 gigawatts of new solar capacity. Now, this is an extremely ambitious program, and it's focused on one out of every four homes being powered by solar. But what's unique about this program is also that almost 70% of the benefits are to be realized by marginalized communities. Like I mentioned earlier, communities of color, uh, low to moderate income communities, communities that bear the burden of our current energy system, but have been locked out of the renewable energy market. That's why uh, under our policy proposal, 100 gigawatts of the 151 new solar capacity would be specifically located in marginalized communities. We'll see $137 billion of new federal government investment to address deploying solar at a local level, adding over a million jobs, $69 billion in savings while reducing emissions, the equivalent of shutting down 48 coal plants for a year or taking 42 million cars off the road for an entire year. So what are the policy elements that we're proposing? Uh, if you go to our website, 30millionsolarhomes.org, uh, you will find a very detailed policy brief, uh, but these are the crucial elements uh, we're proposing, which is restoration, uh, extension and democratization of the investment tax credit. Uh, currently, this investment tax credit is a non-refundable credit, it means that you can only take the tax credit by going solar if you have enough tax liability. And it also requires you to put that money up front. What we're arguing for is to make it refundable, but also provide a direct pay option that can help low and moderate income families have access to solar without a significant upfront investment. We're also proposing a substantial increase in, in investing in energy assistance and weatherization programs. Right now, LIHEAP, the Low Income Housing Energy Assistance Program, as well as WAP, the Weatherization Assistance Program, always run out of money before the end of the fiscal year. And that's because of the need. It, it, there's not enough funds right now in these programs to serve the needs and the amount of energy burden that our uh, residents are facing. So we're proposing to almost double the amount that is invested in these programs and take some of those funds to help low to moderate income families install solar so we can permanently reduce their energy burdens. But we also need accessible and inclusive ways of financing and these, uh, these solar installations. So we're proposing uh, National Green Bank, energy victory bonds, as well as substantial expansion of federal matching grants and loan guarantees in loan loss reserves so that families that don't have access to traditional financing programs can access a loan, a solar loan and be able to go solar and own their systems. We also asking the federal government to support solar workers and small business owners that are members of underrepresented groups so that we can expand uh, the clean jobs, which are good paying jobs to all of the communities, especially under resourced communities and communities of color that have been left out of that transition and of those benefits. In conclusion, we want to prioritize economic, financial and employment benefits, focusing on rooftops and community solar and prioritizing marginalized communities. We want to uh, provide strategies that address this economic downturn. We want to address the climate crisis and use the opportunity to address the longstanding racial inequities. So if you want to learn more about solar energy in general and how you can go solar, you can visit our website, solarunitedneighbors.org, or you can go to 30millionsolarhomes.org for more detailed briefs on the, the policies we're proposing and the national impact report that goes down to the economics of how do these policies affect us in the next five years. Thank you so much, Yesenia. Um, that actually concludes our presentations. And I know that 
uh, there's tons of questions. So luckily we'll hear more from uh, Jasenia as well as David and Joel, who should now be back on the screen for you folks. Uh, friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will be posting it on our YouTube channel as well as a link in a follow-up email to all registrants along with the links and additional resources that were mentioned during the presentations. But now we're going to start with a few questions that came in during that registration period. And then we'll take some of the questions that came in live uh, during the webinar. And I will start with David first, uh, get back to some birds. And one of the questions that came in is, are there any studies indicating how many birds and which ones might be lost to climate change? Um. Yeah, this is this is an important question, and, and uh, it's one that a lot of people are trying to address right now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of projects, a lot of research uh, looking at, at this. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to try to give an estimate of the number, for example, because they're all over the place from different uh, research projects. There's um, uh, very high numbers. In some cases, they may be low. It probably varies uh, quite a bit over different parts of the, the country and across the, the globe. Uh, but we can say it's going to have a, a very significant impact. And, and uh, it's probably going to have a, a very uh, significant impact on species that are already in, in habitats that are sort of uh, marginal, uh, like I mentioned, high mountains or, or far, far north uh, habitats that will disappear, we'll lose those birds. And so the total populations are, are going to, to decline. There's just almost uh, no, no way that uh, we can, can avoid that right now. And it, it will be large numbers. Thanks, David. Joel, a lot of folks, both during the registration period and during the presentations, were wondering about what current research is indicating uh, regarding how to prevent collisions with wind turbines. Um, one of the things that came up several times is painting blades. Um, and I know, I know we put out a statement about that when that study came out. Um, another uh, reference was about helix-shaped blades. Could you please speak towards, towards how we're actually trying to prevent these collisions with the wind, wind turbines. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I mentioned that we don't have a lot of verified methods now for, for minimizing impacts once the turbines are constructed, but yes, absolutely, there's, there's definitely good research going on there. Um, I know that there's good research happening right now on auditory deterrence. Um, a lot of that comes down to figuring out exactly how birds hear. Um, before you can figure out how to deter them using auditory um, methods. Um, there, there's been different forms of work that go into visual deterrence as well. Um, again, we, we just don't have a lot of good stuff, but that's not to say it's not coming. So I, I think we all hope that we can get those minimization measures verified and, and online and available and on turbines as quickly as possible. Um, in, in terms of uh, painting turbine blades, that, that is a, it's a very interesting question. And it's funny because when that study came out a, a little bit over a year ago, it, it really got national, a lot of national press. And what it comes down to is there was a, a single wind energy facility in Norway where they did a study where they painted one of the three blades on wind turbines black and then looked to see how much impact there was on birds and whether that changed it. And they did find a, a very positive response. It was more than 70% reduction of mortalities of some birds. Um, and it would be lovely um, if this was just something that we could, we could really run with at this point. But the reality is, I, I think they painted one blade on maybe five or six turbines black um, out of a, a much larger facility. And it was only at a single facility, and this was in Norway. So what this really comes down to is it's a pilot study, um, and we're certainly very optimistic, but we're going to need to see that validated, not just on a larger scale, um, but also in the U.S. to make sure that it's effective with our species and in our ecosystems. I, I do understand that there's interest in, in doing exactly that. I, I don't know that those studies are underway, but um, so we're hopeful, but we, we can't take it to the bank just yet. That makes sense. More research is always needed. 
Um, which actually leads into a good next question, which is if you had to say uh, what the best research has been done and where, are there things that uh, you mentioned Europe? Um, is the US still conducting theirs? Is there a difference in geography? Um, is there research that you would really highlight and, and promote, as well as what research would you say is most needed? Well, there's a big question. Um, there, there is always the need for more research. I'll, I'll say it, it's it's hard to pick a favorite. Um, I, I will say we we are very grateful for all the research that's going on. I do want to give a, a, a particular shout out to the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, they they are are pushing out a tremendous amount of of high quality science um, looking at this issue of of minimization. Um, I, I know, like I said, there's a lot of there's a lot of research going on on the minimization measures. There's a lot of research going on on how we minimize the impacts of solar, which I didn't have a, a chance to go into. There are collision impacts there um, as, as well as other things. But um, now that we're moving into the offshore realm, um, there's certainly a lot of research needs there as well. We need to make sure that we understand what the collision impacts are and what the displacement impacts are once facilities start going into the water. Um, and there are still some base things that we need to understand out there with regard to how birds are moving around in the offshore environment and what that's going to mean for impacts ultimately. So um, I apologize that that was a very broad answer, but um, there, is, there is definitely a lot going on. David, do you have any thoughts for that question from a climate change perspective? Are there any really important questions that should be prioritized research-wise or things that should be acted on now? Um, we, yeah, we, we need a lot more information on, on how well birds can, can, uh, tolerate and adapt to, to climate change. Uh, what, what is their flexibility? And, and there's a lot of research going on about it, but, uh, but when we talk about birds, of course, it's a very highly diverse group from, from, uh, from ducks to, uh, to little warblers and, they all have different ways they they're going to to adapt so it's going to take a lot a lot of uh, research but but there is a lot that is being done okay i'm going to go back over to you joel um one of the questions uh, that came in is regarding power lines and why they aren't buried so maybe you can speak a little bit more to how uh, with wind turbines, it's more than just the turbines that are a concern. It is those power lines and the additional infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I I can't say that I'm a, a full expert on the power lines piece of the the puzzle here, but um, some sometimes they are buried, and and there's there's been a, a lot of research and thought that has gone into the question of minimizing the impacts of power and transmission lines to birds. There's a, a group called the Avian Power Line Interaction Committee. I think I got that right, APLIC. Um, and they, they have put out, and, and members of the industry, some members of the industry have been using for years, um, essentially guidelines for minimizing this industry's impacts to birds. And I've seen in the chat um, people having this question, but the, the answer is yes, it is considerably more expensive to bury power lines, um, which is the reason why that isn't done more often. So. I think that it, it requires two things. Um, first of all, in order to decide that there needs that power lines need to be buried, there needs to be a very good case for that. Um, people aren't just necessarily going to, to volunteer that. Um, and then it also requires either the, the, the company deciding to do that voluntarily or some sort of, uh, some sort of regulatory hook, um, whether that's through the federal, state, or, or local ordinances. Thanks, Joel. Yes, Anya, I'd love to ask you some more solar questions. Sure. Um, so can you explain more of the difference in details between rooftop solar and community solar? Sure. So when we talk about rooftop solar, we're talking about solar that's installed in a home or a business. It's used to power that home or business specifically. And when we're talking about community solar, we're talking about projects that are installed somewhere else like a church, a parking lot, commercial building, and it's used to benefit other homes and, and businesses. So community solar uh, can be installed anywhere. It, there are 
tend to be larger projects um, and people can subscribe to that. So they, it's like they own a portion of that installation and that is reflected in their bills in the states that allow for community solar. Not everybody does. And can you maybe share some of the ways that people um, or groups can access the solar? I'll admit I live in an apartment building, so I'd love to take part, but don't really know where to start. Sure. Uh, that's why community solar is such a good option for those that live in apartment buildings, for those that are renting, or they don't have a roof that's good enough for solar. Maybe they live in a historic district. Maybe there's too much shade around their house, and we never suggest that you cut down a tree in order to install solar. So if your roof's not good enough or you live in an apartment or you're renting, community solar is an option. And like I said, what you do is you uh, buy a subscription to these uh, community solar uh, projects and you get a uh, reduction in your utility bill based on uh, your subscription. Uh, each project has different uh, discounts and offers. so. It really depends if you're low to moderate income, there are some projects that specifically allow for increased savings for folks that are low to moderate income. For example, there's DC Solar for All, uh, where they can install solar on your home, or if you're a tenant, you can get a subscription to these community solar projects for free and receive 50% off on your bill. So, uh, our website has a little bit more information on the different projects that are available in DC, Minnesota, uh, Maryland and Virginia is about to start soon. That's really exciting. So it sounds like there's obviously a lot of both financial, environmental, moral, and more uh, benefits for, for individuals. Can you speak to how the utility companies are interacting with you and any incentives that you're, you're pitching to them? Uh, yes. So, uh, the way the system is now, if you want to install solar, whether it is a community solar project or is a rooftop solar installation, you have to go through the utility company in order to access the grid, right? Because these systems will be connected to the grid. They control the grid as it is right now. Um, it's called interconnection uh, permits and they'll approve it or they'll ask for transformer upgrade, whatever it is that they need in order to allow the, uh, the installation. So basically that's the process right now. You get the permission, you install it, you power your home during the day with your solar. Uh, and at night you take your power from the grid. You'll get a credit on your bill, depending on which state you are uh, and whatnot. But a lot of uh, states, actually 30 states, DC, and a few of the territories have actually introduced what are called renewable portfolio standards. And this is a mandate to transition to clean energy, which means whether or not the utility wants distributed solar, wants clean energy, the states have said, you have until X date to transition to clean energy. DC, for example, has a 100% clean energy mandate by 2032. So that means that our utilities have to show that they are using only clean energy by 2032. And it has a solar carve out, which is a 10% carve out, which means that 10% of the energy generated in the district has to come from solar. And this is what creates a strong market and makes uh, going solar a very lucrative deal in DC because you have a strong return on investment. And there are other uh, places around the country that have these mandates and have these solar carve outs. And basically the states are taking the decision out of the utilities hands. That's amazing. Thanks so much. Um, and I'm gonna try and transition to a question from that um, back to Joel and David, right? So if there's all these mandates and we're gonna keep building out, how does this impact birds um, specifically? Uh, does the BirdSafe map that Joel referenced uh, for sighting studies take into account any predicted shifts in migratory routes or population hab and habitats that David referenced, which is why maybe both of you can chime in here, um, given the impacts of climate change? So again, how, as we continue to expand, is that being paired with the actual bird movements because of climate change? And Joel, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but maybe you can start. 
Sure. Um, though, though I am stealing David's thunder here a little bit because David actually helped to create the wind risk map before I started at ABC. Um, but now that I've given credit where it's due, um, I, I saw that question in the Q&A. That, that's a great question that has never come up before. Um, that is obviously something that we would want to consider um, if we ever were able to update the map. Um, but obviously, that's not something we do very often. So the answer is not yet. Um, but that, like I said, is a great idea. And, and when and if we get to that point, we'll, we'll certainly consider that. Um, David, any, anything to add there? No, I think that was a that was a good answer. Uh, we we tried to to cover um, all of the options in the in the original version there, but uh, but we haven't op updated it to take in uh, our proposed models for where things might be going. So to address some other questions, then how does that impact uh, land versus offshore wind, Joel? Um, as the U.S. especially continues to promote and, and expand our offshore wind production, how is that going to impact birds? Um, some folks have asked, is, is land versus offshore better or worse? Um, what Are there any other difficulties for birds based off of the infrastructure due to power lines not being at sea the same way? So maybe you can just speak to, to the differences that are, that are being experienced. Sure, um, and I've got nine minutes. Um, so no, I'm kidding. Um, no, that that is um, that that's a very big question. I, I I certainly wouldn't weigh in to say whether land or offshore is better or worse. Um, they're they're different, and again, they they kind of structurally have some of the same impacts um, by way of collisions and displacement. Um, one, I mean, one of the big differences is, is that offshore wind is going to be brand new for us. It's going to be brand new for the U.S. And so um, we, we have a lot to learn. Um, again, we, we have some things that we can learn from Europe, but it's, it is just going to be different here. We have different species. We have different migratory patterns. Um, our, our turbines are going to be larger. We're using this next generation. You know, most facilities seem to be leaning toward this next generation GE turbine which is, is gigantic. They're gonna be a mile, nautical mile apart. So it's just, it's a very different beast already um, than what we're seeing in Europe. So we, we have a lot to learn, a lot remains to be seen. Um, I, I think there's, you know, there are certainly remaining concerns. Um, there, there have been some good things that have happened. There was a, a, a pretty, uh, a fairly rigorous planning process that went into finding the locations for these offshore wind energy facilities. It's not perfect. They had to take a lot of things into consideration. So is it exactly where you'd put it if you were thinking just about birds? No, not necessarily, um, but they had a lot of, a lot of uh, competing interests. Um, but I'll say, you know, at the end of the day, when, when you're trying to figure out what the impacts are to birds at onshore wind facilities, you can walk around underneath the turbines and look for bird carcasses. Obviously, you can't do that in the offshore environment. So it, in order to actually measure impacts, it's going to require technological advances. There, and, and like we were discussing earlier, there are good things happening. The, there's good research happening. There's good technology that's, that's being uh, verified in different ways. Um, collision sensors and there's refinements in digital video technology, some of these things. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of it's not online just yet. So... Um, so we need to figure out how to actually measure the impacts once the, the turbines go in, but there are certain elements like we know that there are migratory land birds that do huge flights over the Atlantic. They essentially in the fall, they'll stage in, in New England and on the East Coast, and then they'll make these huge multi-day flights to, to the Caribbean and Central and South America, and then of course back again in the spring. Um, and there are hundreds of millions of birds that do this, but we haven't really there hasn't been a lot of research really into figuring out, are they flying through where these turbine arrays will be? Would they be flying at rotor swept height? Do they fly higher or lower during, uh, during bad weather events? So we've done a lot of good thinking, a lot of good research and a lot of good predictive modeling, but there's still a lot that we don't know. So in some ways we're going into this with a lot of uncertainty, which means we need to collect really good data and make sure that we're doing the right studies before these facilities are approved and constructed. Totally seems logical to me. <laughs> um, Yesenia, I wanted to go back to you um, and address a question that's come in. Can you speak to 
any um, any differences that you've experienced with the different communities that you've been working on uh, or with rather. Uh, one person asked about that the solar project seems perfect for indigenous groups, um, but I know that you talked about more and different communities as well. So are there any uh, any hurdles that folks can get involved with in helping to spread the word or sharing information? Are there different tactics that you're using? Just if you want to talk to the, again, community aspect. Sure. Uh yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of policy campaigns that can get involved. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, community solar is not a given in uh, a lot of our states. It's not in the law. There's no mechanisms. And honestly, if we're transitioning to solar, if we're focused on solar, it can't be based on whether or not you're a homeowner. You know, we have to have a solution for those like you that live in an apartment or are renting. So we need to convince our state legislators to pass community solar programs so that everyone has access to solar so that this transition is equitable. Uh, there are other ways as well. Um, there's campaigns for allowing power purchase agreements or third party ownership because it's a way for low to moderate income families to go solar at no cost to them. But again, these options are not available to everyone across the country. I mean, Forest Virginia just passed a PPA bill and we spend four or five years advocating <laughs> for the creation of this program. Like we wanna make solar as accessible as possible. We wanna make sure that everyone can go solar regardless of their income level, regardless of their home ownership status, which is why we also are advocating for inclusive financing options like pay as you save which basically allows you to do energy efficiency measures, solar installations, and pay it off of your uh, savings on your utility bill. So. Thanks for sharing that. Um, just before we wrap up, I just wanted to, again, thank our presenters so much for being with us. And I'm, I'm giving them this opportunity to pause because because the last question is a big one, and that is, what is one thing that you hope that people take away from this webinar and share with a friend? I'll give you a few seconds, because I know that's a lot, probably your whole presentation. <laughs> but David, when you're ready, if you wouldn't mind answering. Yeah, uh, I, I think the most important thing to, to take home is that this is really something we have to, to deal with. Uh, the, the issue of climate change and the alternative energy is is uh, one of the big answers, uh, probably the biggest of the answers of, the, of how we're going to have to address it. Thanks, David. Joel? Yeah, I, kind of building on what David said, I, I, I would hope that the, the biggest take home is that in, in order to make this transition, and, and we can do it rapidly, but we, we need to do it right. And that means putting wind turbines in the right locations. And if we're putting them in the right location, um, then, then everybody wins. Um, we're, we're decarbonizing and, and birds are protected simultaneously. And I'm gonna cheat a little bit because on the other side of that, um, we, need to, we need to take dramatic steps and make sure that we're being as aggressive with deployment of distributed solar as we're being with utility scale renewables. And on that and note, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll say, yeah, that keep in mind that if we power 30 million homes with solar energy in the next five years, we can address climate change, we can address the economic downturn caused by COVID, and address social injustice. So one in every four homes should be powered by solar in the next five years. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending and for all of your thoughtful questions. With that, we will end the webinar. And again, thank you to David, Joel, and Jasenia. Um, please connect with us online and on social media. And here's to solar and the birds. Thanks so much. <laughs>